Holy City Center Radio, it's episode 220, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Wednesday, February 7th, 2024. Midway through the week, I hope everything is going well in your world. We're not going to talk about it on this episode, but just before I went on the uh, mic to record, it uh, was in the news that former President Donald Trump was kind of, uh, you know, toying with reporters a little bit, talking about oh, who's my VP pick possibly going to be, mentioned a couple people, one of those people, U.S. Senator Tim Scott here from South Carolina, we'll see if that uh, ends up being the case. But uh, so, yeah, that was like briefly mentioned today and kind of teased. But he did mention a couple of names. Uh, I think, what is it, Governor of North Dakota? Christy Nome was also mentioned. Um, so there's that. Speaking of Tim Scott, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he got the SNL treatment. And actually this week he did as well. Uh, for those of you who watch Saturday Night Live, um, you've already seen it, I'm sure. If not, you can go and, and see the clips online. Uh, it was it's easily the best Tim Scott impression I've ever seen uh, done by Devin Walker, who's a, a newer. He's in a second season, I believe, cast member on SNL. Uh, not that I've seen a lot of Tim Scott impersonations, but it was pretty good. It was it was fairly funny. The first appearance was during the weekend update segment. Uh, the second one was during the cold open uh, during this past weekend's episode. And in addition to that, Nikki Haley, the real Nikki Haley, uh, not uh, someone playing her, also appeared in that cold open sketch um, where she asked someone playing Donald Trump some questions as if she was part of an audience um, and, and then uh, did make a little reference to her oopsie about not mentioning slavery as the cause of the Civil War, which we've talked about before. Um, so. Yes, if you're interested in seeing an impression of Tim Scott or just seeing Nikki Haley's appearance on Saturday Night Live, uh, you can go ahead and see those. As if that didn't out me already, uh, yes, I am oftentimes, most of the time, home at Saturday on Saturday nights, uh, especially that late. Uh, so yes, I do catch many of these episodes live um, or slightly delayed so I can at least fast forward through some commercials. Uh, so, uh, but I swear I do stuff sometimes, <laughs> uh, just, uh, speaking of which I haven't done much since the last episode, but Hey, it's it, Monday, Tuesday. What, what was I supposed to be doing? You know, laying low, doing some work, uh, nothing, nothing exciting to report. Uh, but got some things on the horizon. I'm excited to, to attend and talk about, uh, but we'll get to those at another episode for now. We're going to do what we always do and dive into the latest news. First up, uh, the thing that most of us knew was probably going to happen. Well, one of the scenarios that most of us knew was going to happen with South Carolina's abortion ban. And yes, I know it's not an all right, all outright ban, but might as well be. Um, one of those scenarios is playing out currently. A South Carolina woman who had to travel elsewhere for an abortion uh, just days after reaching six weeks of pregnancy wants a court to affirm that the state's ban on the procedure, which is currently called the quote unquote fetal heartbeat uh, bill, can be detected. Uh, so she's filing a lawsuit saying this should take uh, effect later in the pregnancy that the whole fetal heartbeat uh, term and the six weeks don't are not really compatible. It's going to lead to confusion among doctors and abortion providers. Um, and I, I mentioned at the top that she had to travel elsewhere for an abortion after reaching the six weeks of pregnancy. Now she actually went, as you'll hear more details, she actually attempted to get an abortion before that six week mark and wasn't able to. So it, this wasn't a scenario which I'm sure there's many of those, just not people speaking to the news or filing lawsuits. I'm sure there's plenty of people who have hit that six week mark or after found out they're pregnant and now it's too late to get an abortion in the state. This person was actually before that mark and was unable to get one. So keep that in mind as we go through this uh, story. In the lawsuit, which was filed in a state circuit court on Monday, Taylor Shelton and Planned Parenthood South uh, Atlantic's chief medical officer, Dr. Catherine Ferris, argued that the Republican-led state legislature provided two different definitions of the so-called fetal heartbeat 
in its law restricting abortions. They said the correct interpretation is that the ban begins around nine weeks and not six weeks as it's currently practiced. For those who don't remember, in this law, South Carolina's General Assembly uh, defined a fetal heartbeat as, quote, cardiac activity or the steady and repetitive rhythmic rhythmic, excuse me, uh, contraction of the fetal heart within the gestational sac, end quote. So that's how they've defined it. We've talked before how at six weeks, it's not a fetus. So fetal is already an incorrect term. And it's not actually a heartbeat is it's just electrical impulses, the actual development of the heart doesn't come for a couple more weeks. And, And so the definition is wrong, the term is wrong, and it's leading to some confusion. And Planned Parenthood in this lawsuit is saying it should be nine weeks. Now, ultrasound does pick up cardiac activity as early as six weeks into pregnancy. But as we stated, it's not a true heart. But, you know, that that doesn't matter. And, and I understand that to some people, absolutely. But Planned Parenthood is arguing that the major components of the heart usually form around nine weeks. Uh, at that point in time, the group said it is the relevant limitation under the state's wording. Shelton, who is one of the plaintiffs, said that her Charleston area gynecologist responded as the article um, by the uh, Associated Press says, responded dismissively when she first approached the office about options to end her unplanned pregnancy last September. Facing up to two years imprisonment for violating the ban, some healthcare providers are treading very, very carefully, and it almost sounds like this OBGYN here in Charleston was doing just that because she approached prior to the six-week mark saying she wanted an abortion. Now, putting aside the whole heartbeat aspect of this, she was. this is six weeks prior. Abortions are allowed up to six weeks for any reason. Shelton was lucky in that she found out she was pregnant before that six-week mark. Many people, as we've heard, uh, are not as lucky and don't realize until after that point in time. So she went in, discussed wanting one, and it was prior to the six-week mark, and it sounds like you know, this is speculation because the uh, OBGYN is not quoted in this article and we'll we'll see what comes out in the lawsuit, basically was being kind of dismissive over it, probably for fears of being punished under this law. Now, in addition to this, Shelton noted that she was, in fact, using contraception and not just any. She was using an uh, IUD, it, which is also known as an intrauterine device. IUD, of course, is the... Um, abbreviation for that or acronym and this so this isn't someone just being careless not that that should matter but that's usually a lot of the uh talking points uh, about abortion uh so she was not intending to get pregnant she was using what is uh one of the most effective forms of contraceptives and contraception excuse me and still somehow got pregnant she was you know tracking uh her regular menstrual cycle and something was off. She had missed her period by two days. And so that's when she went to the doctor on September 7th and found out she was pregnant. Obviously, shocking news for her. She went to the doctor after experiencing some sharp pains, uh, and she figured she might have an ectopic pregnancy. uh, But her uh, gynecologist found that the fertilized egg had not implanted outside the uterus, so it was not an ectopic pregnancy, and that she did not face the potential of dangerous bleeding. So this is a whole her life's not in danger thing. She also learned, however, that her body had been trying to expel the IUD, making it uh, bend and sting, and that's where her pain was coming from. So the doctor removed the IUD, and at that point, when they were discussing options, apparently responded dismissively. So again, this is prior to the six-week mark. Shouldn't matter what the reasoning is. So I, I don't know. You know, It's great that they looked to see if it was an ectopic pregnancy. Thankfully, it is not. So Shelton's life wasn't in any danger or wouldn't be in potential danger down the line. Uh, so, But again, this is prior to that mark. So why was she unable to get an abortion here in South Carolina? It seems there's just so much fright about all of this, the doctors don't want to get in trouble, potentially losing licenses or whatever else. Not that that's an excuse because it shouldn't be. They should be doing their job appropriately and helping their patients and doing the right thing. So that's a whole other sign of this. 
But again, this is a, a consequence that we saw coming, that there was going to be doctors and abortion providers who were going to be worried and, and, and might kind of try to steer a patient away from an abortion so they could not face any consequences from it. So thankfully for Shelton, after three trips to North Carolina, including a four-hour drive to Chapel Hill for a September 19th appointment and a two-hour drive to Wilmington for a September 23rd visit, she finally got her abortion at about six weeks and four days of being pregnant. So again, it was prior to six weeks. There should have been no question. All the other circumstances are just interesting. You know, she was using an IUD. Shouldn't matter. Shouldn't matter if she used nothing at all. Uh, You know, so that's not really the point. The main point is here, it appears doctors are being dismissive, are worried and scared, and maybe pointing their patients away from what they truly want and should be able to get under the law, and they're not. In addition to that, part of that confusion stems from the fact that the legislatures do not know how anatomy works, do not know how specifically a woman's body works, and pass the law with terms and definitions that are not medically accurate, or are confusing because they don't know what they're talking about and did not care what professionals were telling them. So again, no surprise. Hopefully this lawsuit will at least bring clarity. I don't think any of us are expecting uh, the abortion ban to be changed in a very significant way, but hopefully it'll push the legislator, legislature to make changes so there's not confusion and doctors can do what their patients need and request as long as it is legal under state law. Nice little tie-in here. South Carolina, just so pro-life, right? That's why they wanted this abortion ban. Uh, They just care about life so much. It's precious. Um, And and, and that's just, you know, that's their firm belief, pro-life. Meanwhile, lawyers for four death row inmates who have run out of appeals are expected to argue to the South Carolina Supreme Court that the state's old electric chair and the new firing squad are cruel and unusual punishments. No surprise, the state, the governor, legislators who are so pro-life are pushing back hard against this because they just want to kill people so badly. Attorneys for the inmates are also planning to argue or were planning to argue on Tuesday. This episode is recorded before any decision was made. If anything significant comes out of this hearing, uh, I will be sure to update you. But we're planning to argue that a 2023 law meant to allow lethal injections to restart um, the executions here is actually a little bit too secret. There's too many details that the public doesn't know about. And, and, you know, when it comes to the new drug that they're using and the protocols that they're going to be using. And and so there's concern that there could be um, some complications and again, could be cruel and unusual punishment. So what's what's hanging in the balance right now? Well, there's the death sentences of 33 inmates who are currently on South Carolina's death row. You know, and although there hasn't been a formal moratorium, the state hasn't performed an execution in nearly 13 years after the drugs it used for lethal injection expired and companies refused to sell them more unless they could hide their identities from the public. Shocker, drug companies don't want their brand name being associated with the, you know, the purposeful death of uh, fellow humans. So South Carolina says all three methods fit the existing protocol. So again, state arguing, no, we're a okay to kill people here. Um, Grayson Lambert, a lawyer for Governor Henry McMaster's office, said that courts have never held that the death of these inmates has to be instantaneous or painless, which not even arguing that this could be cruel and unusual, just saying, "Ah, well, the courts have never said that uh, inmates put to death have to be done. It has to be done with no pain or it has to be done right away. It can be dragged out and there can be pain. (laughs) It's just unreal. But yeah, pro-life, right? So the state has asked the Supreme Court to toss out a lower court ruling after a 2022 trial that said the electric chair and the firing squad are indeed cruel and unusual punishment. The justices added that questions about last year's shield law, that's the law that prevents the drug company's names from getting out to the public, um, should be appealed. And they're bringing that up in Tuesday's argument. So Again, I'll I'll be sure to update you if anything significant happened um, or or what the next steps will be. But yeah, that pro-life state that we're talking about just cares so much about life, cannot allow abortion at any point. But they they were like, all right, we'll do six weeks, which is basically an all right ban. Well, it doesn't matter. They're all for killing, you know, inmates 
and, and look, I, I obviously get the difference between a pregnancy and someone who's been convicted of a horrific crime. I just am not a huge fan of killing people for any reason. Didn't think that should be a controversial opinion. In any event, I'll be sure to keep you up to date on that. And lastly, uh, yes, National Nancy was back in the news. I swear, I'm not looking for these stories. News stories just keep coming out. Uh, so we've talked about all the problems she's had. Nancy Mays, Representative District 1, you know, all know this. We've talked about the problems she's had with staff, former staffers constantly speaking to the press after they leave her office, talking about the horrible conditions and the crazy things she does and how she's not interested in legislating. legislating. Uh, well, guess what? There's a whole new story that came out. According to the Daily Beast, uh, Mace's entire D.C. office has been completely turned over since November 1st. That's right. Since November 1st of 2023, just a couple of months back, uh, her entire staff is no longer in place. Former staff members described the work culture there as toxic and that it was driven by a delusional boss. Toxic and delusional were their words, not mine. They're in the article in quotes. For those wondering, uh, that's nine total staffers that have come and gone within a nine month or I'm sorry, within, since November 1st, nine total staffers, uh, all but one of those employees left on their own accord. So that means of the nine staffers she had, eight left, quit, whatever. One was fired. The one who was fired. Well, that's the former chief of staff, Dan Hanlon, who was fired on December 1st and has since decided uh, that he's going to run against Mace <laughs> for the upcoming election and has officially filed to run. Not a good record. Now, Mace's uh, new chief of staff, Lori Katad, presented the complete turnover as a, quote, non-issue. So that's basically the only statement that her current chief of staff provided to the Daily Beast about this story. She didn't really talk about much of the other claims within it, uh, just saying it's a non-issue. However, former staffers who spoke to the Daily Beast on the condition of anonymity uh, told a very different story. One former senior staffer said that uh, Nancy Mace was abusive, specifically pointing to the frequency with which Mace would communicate with her staff, either over text, the Signal app, or something called Monday.com, which is actually an unauthorized software system that Mace uses in her office. What could go wrong in an unauthorized software system when you are in the U.S. government? What could possibly gone wrong? I mean, it's unauthorized. Uh, maybe it's you know a potential to be hacked or something. Putting that aside, another senior staffer uh, told a story about how Mace called them during – uh, on Christmas Eve, actually, close to midnight, so nearly Christmas Day, and demanded to know why she wasn't getting on TV more during the holiday week. That's right. Nancy Mace called members of the staff at close to midnight on Christmas Eve, complaining about the fact that she wasn't on TV enough during the holiday week. Apparently, they had an eight-minute rule, according to one staffer, which meant they had eight minutes um, to respond to any communication that Mace directed at them, whether it was text through the Signal app or what have you. This was actually a, a rule, they said. This was not just like, a, hey, could you try to do this? This was like you had to. Um, another former staffer says Nancy is delusional as a boss. She says nothing publicly without her consultants or senior staffers telling her to, but takes credit for everything. She's a walking teleprompter. Again, not my words. That's the former staffer's words. Now, I don't take, you know, the whole taking credit thing. I'm sure that happens all the time. That's like the least problematic thing in the story, but worth pointing out that it just, you know, goes hand in hand with some of this other stuff. One of the more telling quotes was a former staffer said Mace has no idea what it actually means to be a member of Congress and is too scared and self-conscious to deal with other people. So she accomplished nothing. Another ex-employee said all this is why pretty much every staffer and fellow member on the Hill thinks she's a joke. Also a big reason why she's only able to hire former George Santos staffers right now. For those who didn't know, George Santos uh, was a New York uh a Republican member of the House, all sorts of scandals relating to, I mean, he lied about all sorts of things. Some, you know, you're like, why are you lying about it? This, this is so dumb. This is not a big deal. But some of it much more important, including uh, accusations of misuse of campaign funds and things like that. You can look into that if you are unfamiliar. 
And Nancy Mace recently hired a former staffer of George Santos. Uh, and it sounds like maybe some others. And uh, her ex staff is alluding to the fact that, yeah, these folks were on this horrible you know, staff with all sorts of issues and problems. And they're the only ones willing to work with her because they probably have no other prospects and no one else takes me seriously. And they're hearing the complaints about working for her. Another incident happened on Good Friday when some staff just wanted to take an hour off to go to mass in the late afternoon. Uh, Mace, who is, uh, talks about how she somewhat recently as in the last handful of years, like really found God and, and Christianity. And she, um, on Sundays, she rarely misses uh, an opportunity to post some kind of Bible quote on her Twitter. No beef with any of that, but I'm just putting that as background as someone who's saying how important faith has become to her recently. Um, you know, and, and puts up these posts and things would think you would think someone like that would be cool with her staff taking just an hour off to go to Good Friday's um, for a Good Friday mass. However, she wasn't having it, two former senior staffers said. And on top of that, the house was adjourned at the time. So it wasn't like they needed to be in the chambers for any reason. In addition to that, another one of the most damning quotes from this article was, quote, for Mace, it was all about control. She didn't see the staff as people, but as property, end quote. That was from another one of her former staffers. Uh, who was previously mentioned uh, as one of the folks behind some of the other accusations. Now, you may remember that a Mace uh, staff handbook was previously obtained by the Daily Beast, and it detailed how her staff was required to book her on national, you know, a national TV outlet between one and three times per day, and how each staffer had to, had to come up with draft tweets for the congresswoman. So constantly doing work way more than other staffs require, especially the national TV requirement. That's insane. Uh, also, according to the handbook, Mace had her staff, held her staff to the standard of passing 10 bills on the House floor every year, which, by the way, would be amazing if that actually happened. Um, it, nobody does that. Uh, but that was her requirement. Um, she also of, you know, 10 bills passed of 25 bills that needed to be presented. So her staff had to come up with at least 25 new bills a year to be presented and considered. And then of those 10 needed to pass the house. Now, of course, it's not up to her staffers what passes it's up to, uh, the rest of the legislature. So, um, how did all that go? Well, during her three years in office, Mace has had exactly one bill signed into law. That super consequential bill? A measure renaming a post office on Hilton Head Island. Going well, isn't it? So three years in office. She should have 30 bills on the House floor every year. 30 bills passed. Or not every year, I'm sorry, in that time frame. And should have had 25 bills each year as well meaning 75 bills should have been presented. Now, I don't know the number of bills that were presented. Um, there's been a decent amount in those three years, but she has only had one actually passed in the law, well short of her requirement and goal, perhaps because, as that previous story mentioned, her staff that's dedicated to the legislating part, the governing part, you know, the most important part of being in federal government, was much smaller than her staff that does things like trying to get her on TV, uh, trying to come up with tweets for her. Maybe instead of trying to be national Nancy, she should focus on governing, getting her house in order, and not being such a shitty boss. That'll do it for this edition of Holy City Center Radio. I hope you have a good rest of your week. I will talk to you all again on Friday. Looking forward to it. A big thank you to Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this and every episode of Holy City Center Radio. And a big thank you to Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every episode. Can't wait to talk to you all again in just a couple of days. But until then, good night and good luck.